Lori Grant, Managing Editor of Transport Topics, and welcome to our Live on Web edition. We're going to talk about women in transportation, especially as the industry seeks to solve one of its most glaring problems, a shortage of truck drivers. American Trucking Associations projects the industry needs 40,000 more drivers to meet capacity demands. Can women help the industry meet such vast needs? Government job figures show that 1,700 truck drivers were hired in April and just 400 were women. The recent jobs data for May showed a jump in hiring to almost 9,000 new drivers, but a breakdown for women wasn't yet available. We wanted to look at some of the ways that women are already navigating the industry. Issues such as work-life balance and health, changes at truck stops and safety, and how to attract more women to the profession. I'm so pleased to be joined by Lisa Mullins, the President and CEO of the National Association of Truck Stop Operators, or NATSO. She'll help us with changes going on to support women at, and truckers at travel plazas. Also with us is Linda Caffey, a team driver for the last 10 years with her husband Bob in the Expedite segment. Their business is Caffey Enterprises, and she is a member of Freightliner's Team Run Smart. She also serves on the board of directors of Women in Trucking. Ellen Roy joins us as well, the president and CEO of Women in Trucking, which promotes employment of women and advocates throughout the ranks. She founded the group in 2007. A little later in the program, we'll hear from Stephanie Klang, a driver of 35 years, currently for truck Conway Truckload. She's driven team and solo. She also serves on Women in Trucking's image team and is an America's road team captain. Our discussion today is underwritten by Omnitrax. More information about our sponsor can be found at the bottom of this article page. We want your interaction. Email us questions or comments to share at ttnews.com, or you can comment directly on this article page in the box at the top of this container. Ladies, welcome. Thank you. Linda, uh, you're our driver, so I want to start with you. You gave up a desk job at a courthouse and started driving full time. You now have more than two million miles under your belt. Tell me, what's your attraction? <laughs> well, basically my first attraction would be the adventure of it. You know, when I worked at the courthouse, I had the same view every day, about <laughs> the same hours. Um, when my husband came home and said, let's go drive a truck, I first thought he was crazy. <laughs> and then uh, we started really seriously talking about when our last daughter left for college. And uh, he was a diesel mechanic, so I was very familiar with trucks. I got my CDL in the early 80s. And I've always been attracted to them, but uh, was not ready. And so we did enough research, and it's a, it's a fascinating career. All right. Ellen, you heard the projection from ATA. 40,000 drivers needed to manage capacity. How, in general, uh, can women help the industry do this? Well, right now, women are extremely underrepresented, uh, just under 6% of the driver population, so which is about 180 to 200,000 female drivers out there. And just to double, if we could just bring that percentage up to uh, over 10%, um, we could solve an immediate need. And I think uh, we're perfectly capable of doing it. We just need to understand how to bring more women into the industry. Okay. Okay, Lisa, let me bring you in. Um, it seems NATSO would have a role in attracting uh, and retaining women as well. What's your, give us your thoughts. Yes, I think that it's more important than ever before that the truck stops are partners with the trucking industry in trying to recruit and retain drivers. Um, I think a few years ago during the economic recession, um, you know, all thoughts were on fuel price and keeping the fuel prices low. Now with the focus on driver retention, I think the truck stops are really trying to, um, you know, make make sure that the showers and the restrooms and the facilities are clean and safe 
um, so that that attracts not just women but also men. Okay, okay. Well, I want to hear more about that. Um, I found that to be quite interesting how uh, things have been spruced up to cater to women. So we'll talk more about it in a minute. But um, Ellen, I want to come back to you. The numbers are quite telling. Um, a recent study of Department of Education data showed that women made up 8% of those who are completing uh, federally approved driving programs and less than 5% are professional drivers, or you said a little bit more than 5% are professional drivers. So tell us, um, these figures don't seem to be any sort of real prescription for that 40,000 that's needed, but uh, one of the things your group does is promote employment of women. So uh, what's it going to take? Give me a few examples of what's it going to take to really boost um, women in the ranks. The biggest issue that we have is image. Uh, women don't think of themselves as being a truck driver. Women don't think of themselves as being a dispatcher. Women just don't picture themselves in this industry. And we're a victim of the media. We're a victim of, look at the toys. I mean, I'm trying to get a truck driver Barbie doll. You know what I mean? Uh, we, actually, we actually came out with um, a Girl Scout transportation patch to teach young girls about careers in the transportation industry because we have this image that we're such a male-dominated industry and women just don't know that A, that they're wanted and B, that they can do the job. So we need to make sure that we can reach out and tell them that yes, you're wanted and yes, you can do it. Okay. Dolls. So catch them young. Okay, well, that's, that's an interesting demographic. Um, Lisa, um, along with your uh, member operators, um, I'm imagining you also survey women as you tour uh, various truck stops. What do the numbers tell you regarding uh, demographics? Uh, everything from you know older, younger, solo teams. What do you even down to the things that people are buying at truck stops? What do you What do you see? Well, I, I definitely see that there are more team drivers. Absolutely, and I think you know I been um, at NATSO for 20 years and I would have thought by now we would have come um, further in terms of recruiting women to the profession. Um, but I do think our, our members are trying to cater to women because they make you know most of the buying decisions now. Mm -hmm. And um, so you see things like clothing. Um, and one of my members even told me recently that he's thinking of putting in a dressing room at his truck stop. And um, purses and things that might appeal to women, gift shops, things like that. Okay. Gloves that fit. Yes. I mean, we, we get a complaint from female drivers that the gloves are all men's sizes. Yeah. Okay, like being in a hardware store or something. Okay, I get exactly. it. All right, Linda, uh, same question for you. You're, you, you know, you're on the road. Do you see women? Are you seeing the same thing? Uh, team drivers? Are you seeing women not, you know, by themselves? What does the demographic look like to you? Uh, probably I'm sensitive to it, but it seems like I see both. Uh, and I see a lot of, there's to me, a lot of women out here. Mm -hmm. A lot of women ride with their husbands. You know, they don't have to drive. Mm -hmm. And I, it surprises me really how often every day you either you see a woman in the driver's seat uh, or walking through the truck stop. It's, uh, that is true. And, you know, back to your glove deal, I mean, every time you feel, you got to wear gloves. Mm -hmm. And if they are huge, it's really hard to feel the truck. <laughs> okay. That's a problem. Okay. Okay, thank you for identifying that. Um, let's drill, I'm going to drill down if we can just a little bit more. Um, we asked our audience for some questions, and one of the common responses was, what one thing, what one thing uh, should be done to attract women to the industry that's so male-dominated, you mentioned image a little bit, um, and what's been successful for retention? So, you know, either one of you or, you know, all of you, what, what one thing do you think can be done to attract women and what's been helpful or success well, successful would, for keeping them? I would say, first of all, change the culture. Um, start. Uh, it's funny because some carriers can't even tell you what percentage of female drivers they have. So our challenge to them is, what, what percentage do you have? What are you doing to attract women? What are you doing to actively look at numbers that you're, uh, who you're recruiting? Um, what data are you keeping? And then are you talking to your female drivers and saying, you know, what do you like about our company? What do you not like about our company? And and so it's all a culture that it's more inclusive. So and. And to talk to the male drivers and say, treat these women as if they're your mom, your sister, your aunt, you know, and make sure that you you um, you treat them with respect because they're all doing a job as well. Okay. All right. Anybody else anything to add? I I would add to that. I when I first started driving, it was you know old Mac, 
and it wasn't very easy to drive at all. It didn't have power steering, it didn't have air conditioning, and I had three sticks. And it was difficult, and I couldn't imagine myself in heavy traffic driving that truck. And now we have a Cascadia with an automated transmission. And I find that I feel a lot safer driving our truck than I actually do our personal vehicle in traffic. You can, the visibility's better, the handling of the truck is much better. I have a lot of technology in the truck that makes it a lot easier to drive in traffic and concentrate on the traffic. Mm -hmm. And I think that it needs to get out there is, is these trucks are set up for safety. And, and I really like that. All right, we're going to come back to safety and technology mm -hmm. and all those issues. So I want to hear a little bit more about that. Anything? I think um, from an awareness perspective, just having drivers like Linda and, and other female drivers that are, you know, examples to other women that, you know, you can do this. It's fun. It's an Mentoring. adventure. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, but also even in, in ad campaigns and other, other things, um, recruitment drives, that they profile women and, and show that women are part of the industry. Okay, okay. And that's, that's one of the reasons we created our image team, is to have women out there talking about things like this. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Um, I, I want to remind our viewers, this is live on web edition of Transport Topics. I'm managing editor Lori Grant, and I'm talking about women in transportation with Linda Caffey a team driver for Cafe Enterprises and a member of Freightliner's Team Run Smart. Lisa Mullins, the president and CEO of Natso. Ellen Voy, president and founder of Women in Trucking. We welcome your participation as well. Please email questions or comments to share at ttnews.com or comment directly on this article page in the box at the bottom of this container. Let me just check first and see if uh, we have any any questions? All right. So um, I spoke with Stephanie Klang. Uh, she is uh, she drives for Conway Truckload. Uh, she's among those top of game drivers who has logged more than three million safe miles. The first woman to do so at Conway. She learned how to drive from her husband 35 years ago and never looked back. I interviewed her by Skype from her home in Diamond, Missouri, and we talked about what keeps her on the road. Tell me what you like about it. Is it the open road? Is it you, you like being behind the wheel? What do you like? What do you what, what keeps you out there? One, it's a feeling of power. It's a feeling of accomplishment every time you deliver a load. I like working by myself. Yes, I have to do everything, but everything's done right, by golly. So, you know, if that, you know, I never go into a customer with a dirty trailer. Sometimes it's difficult, you know, getting everything done. It's a instant gratification. I deliver a load every two to three days, and no matter what is happening in my life or that customer's life, I show up on that dock with a smile, with a clean trailer, and I'm appreciated. So that's what keeps me coming back, is the appreciation and the instant gratification of delivering bit, uh, every load safely and on time. Okay, so we'll hear more from Stephanie Klang in a bit on uh, some of the issues that I do want to kick off with you all, though. Uh, I want to talk about safety. I want to talk about health and some of the uh, work-life balance issues um, that are important to women, really, in, in any industry of the workforce. Obviously, we'll tailor ours for, for the woman truck driver. Lisa, um, truck drivers are out late. Sometimes they're out overnight. Uh, truck stops are viewed as safe havens. And so what are some of the ways uh, that they have evolved to ensure safety? Uh, give us some detail about how they're you know, free, female friendly when we talk about safety. When we talk about safety, I think um, one thing that is extremely important that is, a, it seems like a small thing, but it's really not, is, is having a parking lot that is really well lit. Um, and also having um, truck stop employees that are walking through the lot um, periodically mm -hmm. to give the feeling of, you know, there's somebody out here paying attention and, and that kind of thing. Um, you know, truck stops have evolved a, you know, a great deal from, you know, the 60s, for example, um, there were only men, really, truck drivers. And so I think the focus with more women being out there is we need to make sure that, that the parking lot is, is really safe. 
Okay. Ellen, you mentioned uh, image a little earlier, and mm -hmm. it's um, part of your pitch uh, when, you, when you're trying to recruit or promote the industry. How often does safety come up? Is it a concern uh, w when, you're, when you're out there trying to tell more women about uh, this profession? Very much so. And that's part of what our mission is, is to in, uh, help encourage and support women in the industry. So we talk a lot about safety. We have uh, self-defense uh, videos on our website. We have papers on how to keep safe. Um, women are more situationally aware. Okay. So uh, women won't park in the back. They won't walk between trucks. They'll walk with a friend. Um, they'll, they're just more prepared in truck stops. And so typically women um, don't get themselves into a position that a guy walking through not thinking about it might so um, it's just more being aware and being uh, to be safe okay uh, Linda two questions for you first uh, just tell us from from being behind the wheel what matters safe wise safety wise lighting <laughs> it really is lighting when when I pull into a stop I we switch usually between two or three in the morning two and three in the afternoon so I've got to drive at night and uh, I, you know, I've got to go inside. If I've got to go inside, um, I cannot wake up my husband to walk with me. Mm -hmm. So I look for that. The lighting is really the most important. And like Ellen said, it is situational. I always know what's going around with me, but I always walk with a purpose. Mm -hmm. And I, another thing I always let women know is uh, don't carry a purse. Mm -hmm. You know, don't do anything to attract you, but still be feminine. You don't have to dress like a man. You can still be feminine, but walk like you mean it. And I, I mean, I probably have enough purpose when I'm walking that nobody <laughs> wants to mess with me. But I have not had any trouble either, and I have not been afraid. I, but like Ellen said, I never walk between trailers. I walk on the roadway. And and this whole business of parking closer to the front, even though your husband's with you, you you do that as well because, like you said, you didn't want to wake him up. So is that mm -hmm. a reality for you as well? It is. Okay. All right. Just as significant is health, uh, from food choices to how the cab is outfitted to you know the lengthy sitting. So, uh, Lisa, some of uh, the truck stop operators have become very creative. Uh, things like um, I don't know, ch changing what's on the food bar and things like that. How has Natso helped foster some of these uh, changes that we're seeing either at the food bar or fitness wise? Well, part of our mission is to educate. Um, the truck stop operators and I've been traveling a lot over the last year and I have noticed that um, there's a lot more fresh foods available fresh salads um, fresh sandwiches things that are prepared at the truck stop um, and there's a lot more focus on nutrition um, you know you can pick up an apple or a banana as easily as you can a candy bar so I think that our members are really focused in on that and providing choice I think is is really where they're was aiming. that a specific request of women or did uh, or do you know did men you know they care about fitness as well so d it, was this something they wanted do, do, do you have an idea you know whether this was done specifically for women I don't know that it was done specifically for women but I do think that women are um, more likely to, to reach out for those healthier items okay okay uh, Linda is this what you're seeing are you seeing travel plazas that you know now have healthier things there and is more needed yeah there is there's a, a lot more menu choices but, you know, another thing that uh, many of us do is cook inside the truck. Um, I do a lot of cooking in the truck. Um, I've done videos on how to cook and how to, how to cook in the truck, how to clean up. So... Uh, well, what are some of the things you've made in the truck? <laughs> <laughs> and why didn't you bring any? <laughs> you know, my, my, probably my Chef best Linda. example is a, everybody has a rice cooker. Well, my rice cooker, you can take the, the inside out. And so my best example is to cook spaghetti. You can cook, water, it boils water very fast. You can cook your spaghetti, wow. let that drain. You can make your sauce. I usually do a lot of vegetables. Make your sauce inside your spaghetti. Mix it all together, heat up your water in your spaghetti, in, in your rice cooker, and wash your dishes. It's an all-in-one. I've done wow. casseroles, you can do, it has a steamer in it. You can do salmon in it and, and steam your vegetables. Um, so you can, I mean, the options are crazy on what all you can cook inside the truck. But you also go inside, cool. you know, you get a salad to go with your meal. Oh, okay. Um, I know one of the truck stops is doing the Fit Fair. Mm -hmm. They've also got walking trails. They've got gyms. Um, Freightliner has the Freightliner in-cab training system, which is a series of bands that hook actually hook into the bolt so you can use different, different sizes of bands for exercise. Um, there's a, a lot of work being done about that. Right. I think part of it is being driven by the medical 
um, yes. because drivers, if they don't pass their medical, they don't get to drive. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a, a huge focus on making sure that their blood pressure, diabetes is under control. Um, sleep apnea is a huge issue right now. So drivers are very concerned about passing that, that physical for their CDL, and if they don't pass, they don't, they don't work. Okay, so, so this, this goes hand in hand. Let me, let me also ask you this, Ellen. Um, technology has brought about some changes that mm -hmm. aid in health as well. And there have been um, so many equipment and ergonomic changes to, uh, in, you know, in the cab to work with the, the smaller stature of women. Correct. And so um, you have an initiative as well that um, promotes that. Tell us a little bit about that in ways that you know the cabs changed and what your group is um, supporting. Sure. We've done a lot of research. and We've worked with the University of Wisconsin Stout um, and with Rider, Rider Systems, to design, uh, uh, create a more versatile truck cab. And, and I want to be clear, we're not creating a truck cab for women. We're creating a truck cab that is more adaptable because like Linda, um, her husband's tall, so there's more flexibility in uh, the design. So things like um, the pedals, reaching the pedals, um, the dash, the grab bars, the steps, um, to get into the sleeper. I mean, sometimes you need the uh, you know six foot legs to get into some of those sleepers. Um, and, and one of the things that I'm especially concerned about, and it relates to safety, is uh, something in the cab so that when a driver is sleeping, especially a solo, if they're sleeping and somebody tries to get in, then an alarm will go off or a horn or something like mm -hmm. that. So I'm I'm pushing the manufacturers to try to make some changes and make sure that when someone's in the cab of their truck, that they're they're safe. Mm -hmm. And so many of these initiatives that you're talking about and that I'm seeing on the road, you know, there could be women that are prompting that, mm -hmm. but men really benefit from it too. Um, one, of my, one of Well, one of my members told me once that um, he doesn't worry about um, surveying the men truck drivers as much as he does the women truck drivers because if he can please the women, then he'll please the men too. Um, and so <laughs> we said that women just tend to have higher standards, uh, especially like with cleanliness and things. Um, and so that that's a big focus. So what he him. does for one, he does for the other. Sure. Okay. And men are, well, and women typically want more creature comforts in the yes. truck. So it's not the size of the engine or what name is on the grill. It's <laughs> or it, seriously, it, it's more about it's economy. Like yeah. Yeah. It's more about economy. <laughs> women are more concerned about the fuel economy of the truck and the inside creature comforts. Mm -hmm. um, so and you're right. And and, and Lori, there's one thing that I just want people to be really certain that they understand is um, everything that we do at Women in Trucking isn't just for women. Um, so I'm glad you said that, Lisa, because it, I like to tell people we're not just for women, we're about women. Because mm -hmm. about 16% of our members are men, so anyone who believes in our mission. So when people ask me what challenges do women face on the road that men don't, I will tell you none. Um, it's just that it's prioritized differently and safety is at the top. Okay, all right. Uh, Linda, you started to tell us about your truck. It's a Freightliner 2015 Cascadia Evolution. Um, how tech advanced is it um, and has it made a difference? And how, tell me how it's made a difference for you considering as uh, as Ellen told us, your husband is much taller than you are. <laughs> so it's not as if you know there's an adjustment and it's custom for you. So what's it like for you? Tell me about the technology and some of the other things that you have to do. Well, the first thing is, uh, going back to the money side of it, uh, when we, we purchased our truck, it was business in mind. And I wanted one that got great fuel mileage. And from there, then, I needed the comfort of, that would fit me. So when Bob and I switched drivers, it, within a minute, I can adjust my mirrors, I can adjust my seat, I can adjust my steering wheel, I can adjust all my vents to where everything is just set up for me to drive. And you know, when I first started driving, I, I look back now at how safe I must have felt with the pillow behind my back, <laughs> and the mirrors were adjusted for a six foot guy. And I was constantly, I mean, luckily I got through it. How tall are you? How tall are you? <laughs> I'm almost 5'4". <five>, <laughs> 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 and Bob is six foot four, so it, wow. it really is a huge change. It's a big it's, change, yeah. But it's, you know, the seat is set up, you know, the lumbar supports, everything, the, the back of it is all set up for, uh, for either one of us. Even the seat belt is adjustable on the side, so it doesn't cut off my neck. I, mm -hmm. You know, so all of that adjusts very quickly, and I'm ready to go with it. In a very comfortable truck, the dash is easy to reach. It's all rounded. I mean, people say, how can you drive for 10 hours? Well, my truck is set up to drive for 10 hours. Everything's air ride. 
the dashes for my comfort, the cup holders, everything. In the car, it is not. I do not like driving my car for very long. I, I get tired and I get sore. I, I don't get that in the truck. Okay. <laughs> okay. Very interesting. <laughs> we, we have a question uh, from Joe, one of our viewers. Um, Joe wants to know, what is your position on truck idling? And do you have particular concerns regarding women being exposed to diesel exhaust? Linda, you're the driver. <laughs> uh, no concerns with diesel exhaust. I, I Any concerns about the truck just idling when you you, you, I don't said idle. you know? So what, no. how do you manage? Tr what, so <laughs> I don't <laughs> you're being idling. Facetious. No, I'm not being facetious. <laughs> idling costs fuel. Right. Uh, so when you're doing congestion. Money. Oh, I do idle there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have been accused of at stoplights of turning our truck off, which we do not. But our idle time on our truck is less than 2%. When we pull into a shipper receiver, we shut our truck off. Um, you know, we do try to time stuff so we don't hit congestion. Mm -hmm. uh, we also drive conservatively. Mm -hmm. uh, I, we just don't idle. How, how do we not hit congestion? Do you drive overnight mainly? No, no, we time it. You know, if you know you're going to get in there at 5, if you can take your half hour break and, and offset that congestion. You know, you do what you can. Congestion costs us money. If we're not going down the road, it's costing us to sit there, not only in fuel, but in income. Mm -hmm. So if I can time it to where we could take our break and offset a little bit of that congestion, we're going to do it. Okay, all right. <laughs> I've got another one here for uh, Lisa and Linda. Um, from Dan, what is the social dynamic between women drivers? Do women connect with other women drivers more or less than male drivers? Any idea? You might know more than I. <laughs> you know, I, I, I look at my list of friends, and, and, and I'll have to say that most of them are men. Um, I have a few women friends. It's just because there's more men out here. And the one thing I find is the longer we're out here, that other truck drivers understand truck drivers. Mm -hmm. You know, when you go home, it's hard to have friends because they don't understand your lifestyle mm -hmm. or the fact that from one minute to the next, you never know where you're going or where you're going, you, you know, what, what you're going to be doing. You know, you can sit all weekend, or you can sit all week, for that matter, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you get a phone call, and within 10 minutes you're rolling across the country. Hmm. It's and really gone hard. for two to three months. Yes, yeah. yes, you get the phone call, and you, you know, that's what we usually stay on the road, two to three months. So when we get ready to go in service, it might, you might get a load that day, you might not get a load till the next day. And, but you're always ready to drop everything and run. And, um, so you may go not knowing whether you have anything to come back. You may, you may go for two, three months, and what do you guys do? Just wait and we, do we you know, get a load to come back, or does it matter? We'll come back. Oh, what? When okay. we go, <laughs> but we'll come back. So, uh, you know, a lot of times when we leave home, we'll end up out in California. You know, and we could stay out in California for a week, or we could come back and be in Florida for a week. It, and you just never know. I mean, and that's the, I guess that's the intrigue of the job is you just never know what, where you're going to be going. You, uh, I love it. It's, it's, uh, when you get a load like that, you're like, oh, and you know all your roads to get there. It's like, oh, I'm going to get to see this, this, and this on my route. And I haven't seen it all yet. Well, can I comment on the camaraderie? Sure. Um, uh, we do an annual salute to the women behind the wheel in March of every year, and we bring in hundreds of female drivers, and they're so supportive of each other. They're so they're hugging each other, and we, we had seven women with four million miles, and they got a standing ovation from the group. And it's just so heartwarming to see everybody just getting together because a lot of women aren't as visible on the road. Um, they're getting more visible, but just uh, they don't want to be that visible. They just want to do their job and you know get home. So when you put a few hundred women in a room, um, it's just amazing. It, it's it's truly amazing. And our Facebook page is another reflection of that as well. They're just a very tight knit group. Yeah. Can I add one more thing? Mm -hmm. uh, the thing about um, the women is, like you said, it, the truck doesn't care who's driving, a man or a woman. But you know, men, when you talk to men, they want to solve your problem. <laughs> Okay. When you find another woman to talk to, you can talk about that problem for at least two days and never solve it. Okay. And so it's nice to run I the see, women. I see yes. the emotional connection. Yes. 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 Okay. Okay. You don't need to fix it right now. Let's yes. talk about it. Let's talk about it. I want to beat it to death. All right. <laughs>
Okay. Because there's a commonality of issues. You yes. know, the safety issues the, and the gloves and the, you know, they'll say, hey, what do you guys think of this or where can I get this or sheets that fit or whatever. So I yes. think there's some issues that women will connect well, with. Organizing. I mean, organizing a truck is tough. It's a, you think about living in an eight-foot box, mm -hmm. well, and I have a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. and I, by golly, can organize a truck. All right, so you're gone, you're gone two to three weeks, uh, two to three months. So yes. what's, what's in the truck? Organize it for me. Well, one of the things you got to think about is seasons. You know, in the summertime, we don't carry our heavy, heavy coats. But when we get ready to leave in September, I got to think about the fact I'm probably not going to be back till December. So I've got to make sure I've got our gloves, our hats, and that all takes up room. So you got to have a storage area for it till you need it. But I use a lot of baskets. I use a lot of clear totes because you want to use every inch of space. Mm -hmm. And if there's a cubby hole, I have something in it. But I use um, I use the clear baskets. I use baskets um, in my refrigerator. Things move going down the road. So you don't want to open up the cupboard. And as a short person, everything lands on my head. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm not a cheerful person when I can get in the head. <laughs> so you use bungee cords. You use a lot of Velcro. Mm -hmm. um, I use the expandable curtain rods in my freezer so that when I open my freezer, everything stays there. And I can move my expandable curtain rod, get out whatever I That's need. That's good. Mm -hmm. um, I use koozies. Glass rattles going down the road. So all of my bottles have koozies. Um, so there's, just, there's lots of wonderful tips. I, another neat thing I've started using is uh, hair scrunchies. Mm -hmm. For great around bottles, they protect them from the noise. Oh. So I use, and I, I like cheap too. Hairdressers <laughs> <laughs> are cheap. <laughs> okay, um, we had one other question about uh, speed limiters and whether that will lend to safety. Me? You're my driver. I, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, like I said, we drive for fuel mileage, and in order to drive for fuel mileage, you do not drive fast. So to me, a speed limiter doesn't mean anything. I, I believe our truck is speed limited at possibly 75. <laughs> I, I've never been that fast, I don't know. I, I think when you buy the fuel, you're a lot more conscious of how fast you're going. And for us, uh, it just, it, I don't see speed limiters a problem. I, I, when we go to pass somebody, I take it into consideration and you know, if it's if I can't get by my weight, it's just it's a dangerous situation to pass when you don't need to, and I don't need to blow by somebody at 80 miles an hour. Okay. So I I don't see speed limiters. All right, all right. I don't like the idea. I will say that I like being in control and me speed limiting myself, which I do. Okay. All right. Um, let's hear some more of my interview with driver Stephanie Klang. Uh, she is, uh, I want to talk with her about some of these same issues. And she drives a very comfortable Kenworth T680, but she says it wasn't always that way. When you first started driving alone, or, or even with your husband, you tell me the experience. I'm just wondering, did you have to alter the cab at all in any way because it wasn't comfortable to handle the rig, or that's not, that's never been the case? You talked about how uh, talk about a pillow behind your back to reach the pedals. Yes. <laughs> and they were, they were cab overs, cab over engines. And those were, I mean, they're good for their day, but you got dressed laying down. I mean, that's, there was no stand up room. These trucks. Now we have stand up room. I could even work out. I, I do work out in my truck on the inside. What Not much, what, but I do. You, so what, do what, what do you do? What are some of those exercises? I can do squats in there. There's just enough room to do squats, uh, jogging in place. In fact, I was backed into a dock in Phoenix, and um, I did not have to physically unload the trailer myself. The guys just said, we'll come get you when you're empty. So I'm up in the cab. I have it set up to where I can watch television and jog in place. They actually came up there to see if I was okay because the cab was moving back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> I said, I'm just trying to not get thick, you know. <laughs> which, which is one of those concerns or stereotypes about the truck driver, right? About the truck driver and getting older, you know, getting older and, and, you know, getting in and out of the trucks. I do the squats because climbing in and out, you want to be able to do that with ease. So uh, just a lot of small things. And I, I can do curls. I have five-pound weights where I can do curls. But if I can watch television while I'm doing it, I am there. So <laughs> anything to distract me from the E word. 
you know? <laughs> outstanding, outstanding. Well, let me ask you then about technology, again, in the cab and, and how um, easy or difficult this has made some things. We've got technology permeating our lives these days. And so, uh, you know, it's been a big change in trucks. Either it's the technology or some device that aug augments the technology in a truck. How has it been to adapt to these things? Oh, I tell you, it's been it's been great. Uh, first of all, was our onboard communication, and that meant we did not have to find a, a telephone anymore. Mm -hmm. When we were waiting for a load, we would have to get out of the truck, walk into a telephone, or use a payphone that was outside in the cold. We don't have to do that anymore. The the messages come to us as soon as our company finds a load for us. Then uh, when electronic logs came in. We were a little apprehensive, but after you start using them, you realize what a burden it lifts off of you, the paperwork burden at the end of the day, and, you know, making sure your log is accurate. So once in a while, our logs, you know, the Qualcomm will go down, not often, but sometimes it'll go down, and you should hear us cry like little babies to have to fill out a paper lock. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's just, we just have really become dependent on it. And then the GPSs, I cannot tell you how much that has helped because a lot of times you go into places in the dark or in the fog or, you know, at night, and to know that that's your street. Well, maybe the street sign has been knocked down, you know, then you would miss your street completely. So GPSs have been just wonderful. And on our telephones, we use the Google Maps because when we get an address for a delivery, they give us the address to the front door, not to the docks. With Google Maps, we can zoom right in. We can see the, um, the actual driveway, if there's a guard shack, you know, if there's parking around there, it has just been wonderful. I mean, we don't go in places blind anymore. Well, just a, that, that must just, be quite a comfort as well. It is. It's a lot of information out there, a lot of information, and just, and even the weather's, you know, the, the weather, because we can pull up NOAA weather on our phones and see what's happening ahead of us. Okay. So it's been great. What are some of the other things that you've noticed that have been key to women's well-being, whether in the truck or even at a truck stop? Uh, either way, anything else, you know, over the years, what has some of the evolution been that you think is just, you know, really critical that makes you feel safer? Well, you know, I'm, I can't help but talk about decades ago when the showers were inside the men's room. When I did occasionally drive by myself when I was married um, and I wanted to shower, I had to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning where they would close the men's room for me. Now all of the showers are private. They are tiled. They are clean. It is luxurious, just absolutely luxurious. So that is something that we really appreciate. They even put flowers in there sometimes. You can't tell me women didn't, you know, influence that. <laughs> so, <laughs> Absolutely. A little, a little basket of potpourri or a little vase of silk flowers. You, you know that's for us. Exactly. So. <laughs> you know, the right touch goes a long way, doesn't it? It does. It lifts the burden of the day off of your shoulders, you know, just a little bit of luxury. And that they found that out and they, they try to cater to us. That was America's road team captain, Stephanie Klang, who's behind the wheel at Conway Truckload. She spoke with us by Skype from Diamond, Missouri. With me in the studio here in Arlington, Virginia are Linda Caffey, a team driver with Caffey Enterprises, Lisa Mullings, the president and CEO of Natso, Ellen Voigt, president and founder of Women in Trucking. You may join the discussion by email at share at ttnews.com or by commenting in the box at the top of the page. Ladies, um, I want to switch to um, work-life balance. And um, it, you know, this is an area, no matter what your industry is, this uh, becomes an issue for women because we're the primary caregivers 
uh, no matter how old the kids are, they tend to boomerang. <laughs> um, so, so um, it, you know, no matter even your age group. Uh, so I wanted to spend a little bit of time with that. Ellen, um, let me ask you, how often does this come up regarding uh, recruiting, uh, hiring for women, uh, the driver in particular? And we'll talk about the executive next. But tell me for the driver, when you're, you know, going through what you do. Well, first of all, the average age of a female truck driver is 52. So typically, they've raised their children. Their children haven't boomeranged back yet mm -hmm. <laughs> or live in their own home or whatever. But um, So typically, uh, they go out with a male. And it's a husband, a boyfriend, uh, somebody uh, who has gotten them into the industry. And they'll go to truck driving school and become a team or, or get into the industry. I you know Stephanie got in because of a husband. Linda got in her husband. So a lot of women come in because of a male influence. Now, the big question is, how do we attract the next generation? How do we get millennials? Millennials are looking for something different, OK? And how do you attract uh, young women who haven't started their families yet? Um, so we need to, for work-life balance, there's plenty of jobs out there where you can deliver fuel, you can deliver parts, you can deliver milk, bread, whatever, during the day, or trash. I mean, how many women have thought about hauling trash. What do those guys do? They sit in their, their trucks and the, you know, <laughs> the, the little push a little button and the garbage. But, but again, going back to the image, women just don't think of, hey, did you ever think about hauling trash in the morning and, and then get your kids on the bus, go haul trash, and then be home during the day? So when we think of truck driving, we always think of over the road, long haul. Um, we need to also change our frame of reference and say there's some great jobs where you can put your kids on the bus in the morning, go drive a truck during the day, and be home and meet them at night. So and is that what women in trucking um, is saying? Are you saying it to younger women? Are you going to colleges? Or how are, how are you all getting the message out then to, to shift that number from the average age of 52 to young women? <laughs> well, we're trying to show women, younger women doing this, so younger women with families. Plus, we're trying uh, each issue of our magazine, we feature women in a different job. So we had an issue of trash hauling women. So so that women who are coming into industry go, wow, I didn't think about that, or, um, or delivering parts. So we feature women in different roles uh, where they can uh, either job share or be home or have a, a day job or whatever, and so bring uh, attention to the jobs that are available. What about uh, for the woman executive, uh, the woman who's in the executive ranks um, uh, of, of trucking, or do we find that the corporate workplace already has things like flexible work hours and things like that? No. In this fact, is as much an issue? Again, uh, women in trucking, we represent all women in the industry, so right. I'm glad you brought that up because we don't just represent drivers. We right. represent, I like to say, the women who design the trucks, fix the trucks, sell the trucks, drive the trucks, own the trucks. Um, and, and about 14% of management in the industry is women, just 14%, compared mm -hmm. to 52% outside the industry. So it's still very male dominated. So mm -hmm. when you go into a trucking company and you start talking about flex time or work life balance or whatever, um, it's not that the carriers don't want it to happen, it's that it needs to be brought to their attention. They, it, we need to call them on it and say, have you thought about this? You know, just like Cheryl Sandberg of Lean In, like maybe mm -hmm. front row parking for the pregnant woman, you know, things like that. Um, because the, the carriers are very amenable. They, they want to bring in more women. They understand the need for diversity. Mm -hmm. It's just they, they want, want to know how to do it. Mm -hmm. And that's where we come in. We, we, we are You're the, the consultant. Okay, We're the resource. resource. Oh, yes. OK. OK. Um, Lisa, what are you finding along these lines? That I think work balance? You know, more short haul driving. I think, um, yeah, you talked about that. I think a lot more drivers want to be home at night. And I think that's women driven. But I think a lot of men want to be home at night, okay. too. OK. Th does that play at all into, high, into um, promoting or, or somehow luring younger drivers, just, to, just by letting them know not every uh, job is one where you'll be on the road for two to three months? Yes. Does that help in the message? But the key to luring younger drivers is the use of technology. They look at a truck and they see, they think of it, it's a, a dirty diesel engine. Um, we need to show how, how cool the cab of a truck is. And we need to show them, look, this looks like the inside of an airplane. I mean, look at the dash of the truck. Look at all the amenities. You have the air ride seats. You have automated transmissions. You have um, so much technology to be able to see outside the truck and things like that. We need to make it almost look like this is as cool as playing a video game. <laughs> you know, to bring the next generation in, we need, to, we, may, we need to make this industry look like we've caught up with the 21st century. OK. All right, like an airplane. Exactly. 
Yeah. <laughs> all right. I know one. So. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Linda, um, you took to the road professionally after your two children left home for college in uh, 2000. So um, how much is work-life uh, balance an issue for you uh, at all? Because again, you said you're gone two to three months at a time. Are you missing key family events or you know things for friends? Or does it even matter? Well, it always matters. I mean, family is one of the most important things to me, and I, um, we, you know, sometimes you got to pay your dues, and we did pay our dues, and you know, progressed from being drivers to owning our own truck, and now to the point of where we can control our destiny quite a bit. And um, you know, he talked about the boomerang effect. Well, our oldest daughter tried to get away with from us, and we followed her so she could babysit us. Now we live with our oldest daughter, but we get to see family more um, because before at the courthouse we had you know two weeks vacation, and we used the two weeks vacation. Well, now. We drive all over the country, and if we're in an area where a family member lives, we show up with our dirty clothes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how much notice you get. <laughs> so uh, in, in reality, I, I really love that part that we get to see family a lot. Okay. And um, now, at the same time, though, you know, the barbecues or the picnics, we usually miss those because we can't time that one. Mm -hmm. we, we're just gonna show up unannounced. And believe me, I'm not kidding when I talk about bringing my dirty clothes, mm -hmm. I really do. <laughs> um, our, our laundry mat at the house is nice. Uh, but I, the thing I also like is we're always available. Um, when I worked at the courthouse, you know, I couldn't take a personal call. Now mm -hmm. in the truck with my headset on, my girls can call me anytime they want, any time zone. Um, one thing we did now with FaceTime, you know, FaceTime mm -hmm. on your iPhone is wonderful. So over Easter, we were not together. My, and our family is very close, my, our girls and Bob and I. And one daughter was in Dayton, Ohio. The other daughter was in St. Louis. And Bob and I were in California. And we all like to play board games. Mm -hmm. And we set up a board game in the truck. <laughs> and I had one girl in a vase. And one girl was in my <laughs> silverware using FaceTime. And we sat and played games in the afternoon. And they, ch and they beat us. <laughs> but they were ordering us around. We'll move this here and there, and you know, we spent two hours playing a game. And right? you had the board there. You could have cheat. I know. <laughs> I know. I, I, you know, did yeah, us. So, to me, trucking and, and our lifestyle, I, I'm more there for the girls. Mm -hmm. At least by the phone, if not. And, but you know, if I was working and they live cross country, I couldn't drop everything and be by their side either. Mm -hmm. So one of the worst things probably happened to me is my dad died while I was on the road, and I just about didn't make his funeral because we couldn't get the connections coming back. So that part is tough. You have siblings, I gather. You didn't. You weren't responsible for all of those sorts of arrangements. When you no. do get in an emergency, where I'm going to is when you do get in an emergency situation like that. How? How family. do you handle okay. it? Was fam family took, you know, took over for us, and uh, that does happen mm -hmm. sometimes. You know, it, uh, that's tough. Okay, okay. Anything else regarding image or anything else when we talk about uh, this whole business of work-life balance and trying to attract uh, younger workers or, or just more women in general? I'd like to address the issue on image because I deal, I work a lot with new women drivers, and a lot of times it's the men are trying to talk their wives into going with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, the women's conceived notion of what trucking is like, it's, it's not often what it is. The, the guy wants to be super trucker, and she's not so sure she wants to fit into that. But, you know, one thing, you can stay a lady and drive a truck. You do not, you know, you can, you can still stay that woman. and you can stay as a professional. Um, I always wear slacks and a button-down shirt when driving. My husband wears uh, slacks and also wears a tie. Um, we have a successful While business. driving? While driving. He wears a tie while driving? Yes. OK. Uh, we have a very successful business. And I want to present that. Sure. You know, I, we have a good business. Well, but, but are you going, is that because of the customer where you're going? Or, I mean, I raise it because obviously it's, it seems unusual. Even, you know, we get in our car and we start loosening things and picking <laughs> off things. And so, you know, to, I know I realize he's at work and in a truck. So why, why the tie? And then do you, I mean, how formal are you? You said nice slacks. How formal are you, though, usually? I don't wear a tie. Okay. <laughs> I do have very nice button down shirts. We have a uniform that we have created. Um, and we are, we're at least the land star, so 
we usually will have our Landstar colors in it, and we go along with our truck. But I want, when somebody drives by our, our truck, to see a professional driving mm -hmm. at the wheel. And you can drive in a tie. It really, it's okay. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> it's, uh, we deal with a lot of high-end customers with what we do. Uh, it's surprising how many times Bob gets a thank you for respecting the customer when he walks in. Um, you know, the tie's on everything. We have to, we go in with a clean truck, we're presentable, and we speak presentable. You know, we want them to feel very safe when they put their freight on our truck that is mm -hmm. going to be delivered safely. And it's a complete total image that we are presenting to the public. And you get treated at the customer's oh dock yes. so much better. You also clear yeah. Bob has cleared a dock because they thought he was an inspector and everybody was. <laughs> <laughs> but you get treated like a professional when you walk and act and respect yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and also, the truck stops, like Linda, you were saying earlier, that truck stops now are not just for truck drivers, OK? Mm -hmm. They're huge. Uh, you know, you've got the four-wheelers on oh, one right. side. So you've got families in there. And so when you see a truck driver wearing a tie and dressed up, mm -hmm. it helps the image of the industry when the non-trucking public sees people like uh, Bob and Linda dressed okay. professionally. You, you walk and talk differently when you're dressed like that, and you have the respect. And uh, I, I'm very proud of what we do. Very proud. Mm -hmm. I'm sure our industry is as well. I want to talk about uh, pay issues. I want to wrap up uh, with this. Uh, we'll take some more questions from our, our, our viewers as well. But um, at the end of the day, women make up uh, more than half of the workforce. And some are the sole breadwinners. Some contribute. And um, all of them are fully engaged in the well-being of their family, the well-being of themselves, well-being of their career. And so um, Linda and Ellen, uh, you two first as our executives here. It seems to raise awareness uh, of careers in trucking, uh, driving and otherwise, and to raise employers' awareness of um, how they can support the integration of women into this industry, it seems that pay would be a critical factor. And so w what's realistic in terms of median incomes? Uh, I'm sure you must get this question a lot. What, what's realistic in terms of median, in terms of median incomes, um, and how does that square with men, that, that whole pay equity question? Well, I would say uh, that women in non-traditional careers uh, usually make a higher uh, salary, higher living than women in traditional careers. So working in the trucking industry, you've already you know, you're in a non-traditional environment, and it's a higher paying job. So if you're going to do a software at a, a bank or a software at a trucking company, odds are you might have a little bit higher salary, hopefully. Um, so it, because of the non-traditional status, it's, uh, the trucking industry is a pretty well paying environment. Okay. Um, now for the driver, uh, and forgive me if you were going to answer this, but again, we always say it doesn't matter, the steering wheel doesn't know whether you're male or female, you get paid by the mile, by the load, by the percentage, or whatever. And, and it's really up to you to, you know. OK. Is that a good selling point when, you, when, you, when you're talking to Excellent women? Excellent selling point. In fact, we actually will say to women, you can earn a lot more money in the trucking industry than you can in a child care job or something like that. And you can learn this job in a matter of weeks um, and be professionally trained and, and earn a decent living. So yes, we're not saying that it's an easy job, but we're saying that it's something that if they can do it and they can handle it, then they'll earn more money. Okay. okay. Anything, anything uh, to add to that? No, I don't think so. All right, so, so then um, what about some of the other factors, like we were talking about numbers earlier, being too few in number in boardrooms? Um, is this a deterrent for women when they can't find that kind of, or they think they can find that kind of um, gender kinship? So you said when everyone's in this room together, it's hundreds of women, and it is rah, 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 right. rah. But you know, when, when you're promoting the industry, mm -hmm. w what do you find there in terms of you know, telling women there are places to go here. Not everyone is driving. You can do other things. How does that? Do you know what's really interesting? When I'll speak to groups, I'll ask women in the audience who are executives in the trucking industry, how many of them actually in high school or college said, I want to work in the trucking industry? Nobody ever says yes. <laughs> we all got there inadvertently somehow, but we all love it. And the one thing that you hear over and over again from women executives is, I'm usually the only woman in the room. And for me, working in the trucking industry, I've always felt that way, like I'm the only woman in the room. But we don't notice it as much until somebody points it out and says, hey, 
or until you see another female executive over there and it's like, oh, wow. And you make your way over there because you have this, this camaraderie because it's such a male-dominated environment. And that is changing. Um, we're actually doing a WIT index with, with the University of Memphis to determine how many women are in boardrooms on publicly traded um, trucking companies, how many female drivers, and how many female executives, uh, women in management they have. And so we're going to come out with a WIT index so that we can monitor this as the years go by to see if we're actually changing things. So there's, we have a long ways to go. 14% of women in management in the trucking industry is not acceptable. Okay. And the diversity in the boardroom will help that trucking company. And, you know, as far as truck stops go, a lot help of them help in retention and, well, yes, and attraction right. the bottom line. Yeah. to the right. It will, because, um, you know, as far as the truck stops go, a lot of our members, I would say most of them are family owned businesses. And so they've had the, you know, the man and the woman, the husband and wife working together as a team on the business. And having a woman in management helps, I think, in terms of just thinking like your customers. You know, you need, if you're going to try to attract women, you've got to think like a woman and have a woman's perspective mm -hmm. on things. So, you know, I think that helps our members um, tremendously in trying to, you know, retain women. Well, and more women in leadership roles, visible in leadership roles, helps women to come into that, to mm -hmm. that carrier. If yeah. they see a trucking company that's run by women and women who are out there speaking and, and talking, they go, hey, I, I, I'd like to work there because they're very... There's uh, some representation, uh, exactly. some thought that this is a group that's sensitive to this. Yeah, exactly. you need to be able to see yourself in that role. Right, and you need to see other people who are doing that job. And so for trucking companies uh, to have women in highly visible senior management roles, when they start looking around, they start seeing things differently, and they're like, wow, why is that recruiting ad not <laughs> diverse? Or, or why are we doing this? Or why aren't we, why don't we have a, female's rest or a female right. restroom? And the, you know, so women will start noticing things that the men have always just taken for granted. And not that they don't want to change. I mean, that's, I want to make that clear. They just don't see it. They just don't see it. That's and right. so it's a different mm -hmm. perspective, because the trucking industry really does want more women and, and embraces women at mm -hmm. all levels. So. Um, it's just it, t it takes women in trucking and, and drivers and you know to, to point it out and say here's some changes that you can make and and like with the truck stops our, our female drivers talk to Tia Petro about orange towels or these fluffy more towels. than one towel and <laughs> and more than one, and, and um, hair, the hair dryers Yes. and uh, big shower heads and things like that, and they listened, uh -huh. and amenities and things like that. So and space to put your stuff. Exactly. <laughs> and laundry rooms that have hang-up racks. So That's right. One of my favorite is a, a male driver who said, I love women in trucking. I love the new shower heads and the truck stops, you know, and so everything <laughs> we do, it's not just for women. Right, right. The men love it, too, in getting two towels. Yes. Yeah. Right. That's right. It's yeah. yeah. the little things. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so, so then, uh, Linda, I've got a... Um, ask you, you, you've done the desk job, you've got two million miles on the road, which, which one? You got any interest in this whole boardroom stuff they're talking about, or are you going to stay on the road? You know, I, won't, I, won't, I wouldn't say I wouldn't come off of the road, but it would take a heck of an income. Okay. Um, it would take a really big income to get me. And more than two weeks of vacation. Oh, yeah. yeah I got to travel. <laughs> I'm, you're not <laughs> trading the adventure. You called it adventure. You know, I, yeah, no, I, you know, I know I don't look forward to Fridays, and I don't dread Mondays. Every day I wake up, and I, I, I really enjoy it. I, I like looking out that windshield. I like waking up in a different place every day. I don't really like when I get out of the truck and I try to figure out which way the restroom is or which way the building is. That's kind of a challenge sometimes. But I like what Bob and I are doing. I, I like the people we meet. I like the men I work with. I find the men in trucking are a, a lot often more debonair. Is that, um, you know, they, they open the doors for you. They see you coming and they go back and open the doors for you. They, they see you having a problem getting backing into something. Or, and uh, many, many of the times they will stop and give you the room you need or help you. I, I find the men in trucking are just chivalry wonderful. is not yeah, to take yeah, yeah. the road. Yes, all right, all right. Is, and I, I love it. I, I, I think that we fit in really well, and I do think we help each other. And uh, it would be very difficult to get me out of my truck. <laughs> all right, all right, there it is. She, she just said. It. All right, um, let's take uh, some questions here. Let me see. They've scrolled up quite a bit. Um, 
it, it's not directed to anyone in particular. So uh, what are your thoughts on entry-level driver training? What is the best method for training future female drivers? Uh, I'd like to take that one, Laurie. I, I actually served on the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration's Entry Level Driver Training Advisory Committee, and we just That's finished. That's a mouthful. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we just finished um, the rulemaking for entry level drivers, and one of the things that I did make sure um, was included in there was some lifestyle issues, not just fatigue, um, but we need to, most most drivers wash out in the first three to six months. Well, three months actually. Um, mm -hmm and whether they're male or female. But I don't think we do enough of a, a good enough job of preparing people for the change in their lifestyle, the change in their eating habits, the change in their family um, situation. So we need to do a better job of saying, kind of like the Marines, you know, this is a difficult job, but if you can do it, you'll be proud of what you do. So I think, uh, you know, as far as entry level drivers, we need to be a little bit more realistic about what the job entails, um, but we also need to be honest. Anything else regarding entry level? Uh, anything, Linda, you, you, that you've learned that you think younger women could benefit from, uh, you know, that would, if it were a part of training? Anything? I'm going to agree with her. It, it's lifestyle. I think uh, most people wash out due to lifestyle. It's a, it's a huge change. I mean, you know, you go to your 9 to 5, all of your whole day is laid out, but you don't have a regulations. When, when you get into trucking, you have so many regulations of what time you can get up, what time you can be sitting in the cab. You know, when you're going down the street with your husband, you guys get to sit next to each other, not in trucking. Mm -hmm. um, I only have certain times when I can be in the front with Bob. Other than that, I've got to be in the sleeper. Mm -hmm. So we've got so many regulations that we need to be aware of, and it, it is a huge change. I mean, what time you get up, what time you go to bed, when you can take a break, how, how many hours you can drive it. It is a huge lifestyle change, so okay. you got to be ready for it. All right. Let's take uh, another question from Kim, uh, who is a CDL admissions placement coordinator. What are carriers doing to alleviate sexual prejudice and abuse of new women drivers, especially in the trainer-student scenario? This was an issue a that's, while ago. That's a very difficult question. Um, one trucking company, Prime, tried to use same gender, had a same gender training policy, and then they were sued by the EEOC because women weren't getting trained as quickly as men. So th the training situation is huge. Um, I always say, what other industry puts two unrelated opposite gender people in uh, an enclosed space with a bed six inches away and sends them out for two to three or four weeks? Um, uh, I, it's something that this industry ha struggles with, and I think we, we can do a much better job, whether it's uh, cameras on the cab, not in the sleeper part, but uh, watching when the driver train is going on, or better, we came out with an anti-harassment employment guide. I was, was going to say, I don't want us yeah. to imply that, it, that every situation is a harassment situation you know, right. uh, by men at all. Certainly there are plenty of men who train women just, and just respect fine. them very and much. Respect them very much. Respect exactly. them very much. So, but but we do have an issue because you're you're putting two unrelated individuals in the cab of a truck together for weeks at a time, mm -hmm. and and one is in a power position because they're the trainer, and they determine whether the person passes or not. So, uh, we have a long way to go, and that's one of the issues that Women in Trucking has worked on a great deal. Um, it's a sensitivity issue, and when I talk to carriers, I'll say, go back, talk to your drivers, talk to your trainers about again treating the women. Uh, their peers as professionals, but it's still an issue. You know, even with Bob and I, we've been married 37 years, and it was very difficult to leave home and get in a truck where we couldn't get away from each other. It, uh, it's even being married. It's it's stressful at times to, to how to communicate, mm -hmm. um, and you can't you can't. I mean, slamming curtains doesn't <laughs> work. <laughs> It doesn't have to quite, quite oh, the same impact yeah. as a slamming a door. Yeah. So I'm there. Exactly. <laughs> Take that. Okay. Quite telling. <laughs> Something was to revisit. We'll keep that in mind. Uh, here's another one from Michelle. I'm wondering how, as the only woman driver at my location, I can encourage male management to give me the same respect and benefit of the doubt as my male counterparts 
when issues arise. Things like this make it much tougher to stay committed to an employer since we all do the same job. I, I don't know. I would say if that's a driver who isn't happy with their company, who doesn't treat them well, um, <laughs> there's a need for good drivers out there. I would say find a company that treats them well. I would say look on the Women in Trucking website for trucking companies that are supportive and are actually being proactive and not only attracting but retaining female drivers and are making loud noise about what they're doing. So there's, there's companies out there that welcome, invite, and nurture and support their female drivers. Anything else? I, I'm going to agree with that. Or right. advice. Yeah. All right. Um, we'll take just uh, maybe two more and, and, and then uh, uh, close out. This one's from Sandy. Uh, where do you refer women with no finances to get training as drivers? Is that possible? Are there scholarships available? Are there? Well, we have a foundation and we have scholarships, but there's carriers out there who will pay for somebody to go to truck driving school. Um, they'll pre-qualify them and then they'll have tuition reimbursement. But there's also carriers out there that will actually train the drivers and it doesn't cost the driver a dime unless they leave uh, while they're still under their contract. So I would say, again, look at the Women in Trucking website. Make informed choices because the worst thing to do is to come into this industry and not ask a lot of questions and not understand the different types of carriers, the different types of trucks, the different ty types of commodities, you know, uh, from expediting to over the road, things like that. So uh, again, that's what we're here for. We're a resource. So. Should, should, is it important to make sure any sort of training program is a federally approved one, something certified by the government, just to make sure once you've got the piece of paper it means something? Is that I would, critical? I, I don't, there's not really any federal approval at this point, um, but once the entry-level driver training requirements are in place, um, there, it will be easier to choose. But again, I would say ask for referrals um, and ask what companies, go to a carrier and say, which truck driving schools do you hire from? Which mm -hmm. are legitimate? Um, and, and there's some um, truck driving uh, associations uh, truck driving school, uh, National Association of Publicly Funded Truck Driving Schools, and then uh, the Commercial Vehicle Training Association, they actually have requirements for their schools to meet. So again, it's being educated and informed and making the right choices. There's also, uh, to me, on like the Facebook page, the Women in Trucking Facebook page, you can talk to a driver that's done everything from hauling livestock, tankers, right. flatbed. Ask them and figure out what you're interested in. And then you start looking for a company interviewing them. But do your research first mm -hmm. or expediters. Very interesting. Expediters Online has got a great forums to talk to drivers. But I would talk to the drivers first, yep. other drivers first, and then look for your company. See what interests you. All right. So we'll take our last one from Leah. Of the carriers successfully adding women to their fleet with job placement, what are they doing right? Well, I'll, I'd love to jump in on that one um, because we actually highlight them. They, um, they honor, respect their female drivers. They uh, recognize them. They bring them together. Um, they ask them questions. They'll ask them what technology, you know. Uh, and a lot of the carriers that have higher percentage of female drivers um, use a lot of technology in the trucks, make sure that, uh, you know, it's uh, adaptable for women, yes. um, get them home more often, and, uh, and it's just a culture. I'm going to go back to that culture again. So if you uh, find out that a trucking company has 2% female drivers as opposed to that one that has 18% female drivers, I would definitely go to the one with 18% female drivers because they're doing something right. Do, do women tend to talk to each other too about, you know, what, where to work, and, and so that may aid in the recruitment, I would think. Very much so. In fact, our Facebook page, the Women in Trucking Association Facebook page, we have about 8,000 drivers on there, and that's all they do. Very active. Yeah. Very active. But yeah, which, mean, which means some of them are men drivers, then. Yes. Oh, yes. yes. So, that, so that's one of the ways to involve men in the discussion as well on the Facebook pages. Executives even yes. could look there and see, OK, here's what women are talking about. Here's where a trend is. Here's it's a great way to get a pulse of the trucking industry. You ask a question, and you'll get, I ask a question, and I'll have 400 responses within, you know, 20 minutes on, <laughs> wow. on anything, just about anything. So yeah, it's a great way to get the pulse. Okay. Well, ladies, um, what a wonderful conversation, um, but we'll have to leave it there for right now. Um, you've been watching live on web uh, edition of Transport Topics. 
Our thanks to Linda Caffey, a team driver and owner operator of Caffey Enterprises, also a member of Freightliner's Team Smart and a board member of women, a board uh, member for image of women in trucking. Uh, Lisa Mullins, the president and CEO of the National Association of Truck Stop Operators. Ellen Voy, the founder and president and CEO of Women in Trucking. Stephanie Klang, a solo driver for Conway Truckload. Uh, you can see the full interview with her on our website. Also, thanks to our sponsor, Omnitrax. More information about Omnitrax can be found at the bottom of this article page. And thank you for watching. Coverage of these issues and more are regularly available to subscribers of Transport Topics. You don't want to miss it. There's a free trial just for today's viewers. Go to the subscriber page at liveonweb.ttnews.com. For more Live on Web coverage, also visit the same web address, liveonweb.ttnews.com. Our program was produced today by Kevin Eaton, Brandon Green, Tara McClellan, Shehad Mustafa, Dana Peterson, Joseph Terry, and digital media editor Gary Kosinski. Thank you so much. I'm Lori Grant. <laughs>